I'm, I'm really happy to see so many people. I was convinced it would be a very unpopular subject somehow. Um, so just to, to begin, that I think this talk was prompted because over a very short period of time, I had several uh, very significant bereavements. And, um, and they were all quite sudden. And I just thought to myself, well, if God, life, if, if, if this is what I'm given, I'm given death, well, then I shall take death as my teacher. And this talk is um, really in my journey so far. Um, I thought this would be a very good starting point, and it comes from this wonderful novelist, Chinua Achebe, who's a Nigerian, very renowned Nigerian writer. And beyond death, that there are no ideals and no humbug, only reality. The impatient idealist says, give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth. But such a place does not exist. We all stand on the earth itself and go with her at her own pace. So let's start there. We're all standing on the earth. And in the same way as in a Buddhist story, um, a woman's baby dies and she uh, eventually goes to the Buddha and says, uh, you know, bring him back. And he says, uh, oh, go and get a mustard seed from a house that hasn't known death. Uh, she goes to every house in the village and there isn't anyone. So she re understands and um, follows the Buddha. So there's no such mustard seed here. So just over a year ago, I found myself plunged into a place where all meaning was wiped away. All that I felt I knew and believed in was made meaningless. A kind of dark emptiness where I had no volition or agency, stripped of everything. It was so profound that nothing could distract me from it. I was in the underworld. I was able to function in an ordinary way with the usual demands of life, but inwardly was in a deep, place of anguish. I think the, the, it wasn't so much um, a loss of person, but the absolutely um, suddenness of death, absolutely unexpected suddenness of death that just arrested everything in me. Um, and no um, metaphysics, no wonderful words did anything. So the first thing that I was given on my request, uh, so the first thing that came to me uh, was a book called The Descent of the Goddess, which is an ancient Sumerian myth. So Inanna, who is here on the right, who is the queen of heaven and earth, uh, chooses to go, she chooses to go down into the underworld, the place of no return to attend the funeral rites of her sister's husband. As a precaution, she instructs her assistant, Nishiba, to appeal to the father of the gods to intervene if she does not return by three days. Her sister, Ereshkigal, the queen of the great below, insists that Inanna be treated in the same way as everyone and is stripped naked and bowed low and killed. After three days, when Inanna fails to return, her assistant Nishibu sets in motion her instructions. She goes to the god of the sky and earth and the moon god Inanna's father and they both refuse, not wanting to have anything to do with such a place. Enki, the god of waters and wisdom, rescues her Using two little mourners, he creates from the earth, from under his fingernails. They slip unnoticed into the underworld, carrying the food and water of life. They gave Ereshkigal so much empathy 
that she lets Inanna go and she is revivified. So uh, Sylvia uh, Brinton Pereira, who, uh, who uh, wrote this book, what she says about it, that it's the story of an initiation process into the mysteries. There is a gate into and out of the underworld, later called Inanna Ishtar's door. Through it, others who made the journey became conscious of the underworld. Were adv- to become conscious of the underworld, were advised to pass. Inanna's path and its stages may thus represent a paradigm for the life-enhancing descent into the abyss of the dark goddess and out. Inanna shows us the way, and she is the first to sacrifice herself for a deep feminine wisdom and for atonement. She descends, submits, and dies. This openness to being acted upon is the essence of the experience of the human soul based with the transpersonal. It is not based on passivity, but an active willingness to receive. So death brings us face to face with God or our transpersonal reality. This is an, in, this is an inevitable meeting in physical death. The myth implies a conscious and willing meeting face to face as mystical experience, a universal and collective archetype relevant to all human beings and all cultures, and that there is a well-trodden path for us to follow. I found a place of deep acceptance and patience when I found myself in my underworld, knowing that eventually I would be brought out, which ultimately proved to be revelatory. Uh, which I'll um, bring in the talk a bit later on. There's something very moving about the two mourners, moulded from earth, that are able to enter into the place of non-being. And how powerful is the revivifying quality of empathy and compassion that they offer. The earth being the lowliest place is a place of prostration. And the earth here somehow echoes our creatural nature. To prostrate to the earth is to enter non-being, a kind of death. Yet like physical death, it also relieves us of all the burdens, sorrows and suffering. So from um, my experience, my underworld experience, one of the things I realised about it, because it was so non-conceptual, that actually it was just purely existential experience. All I could do was be. Um, And the way I did it, actually, was just to sit and play patience by candlelight and just be with it and be with it. So the next place to go is existentialism. And the person who is who's most, uh, the most original, most important, one of the most or, um, considered most important philosopher of the 20th century is Martin Heidegger. And he asked the question, what is the meaning of being? Which is, is his mode of um, um, a philosophizing. And at the heart of his, um, of his work is, uh, is fear of death. And the mode of inquiry is through being itself. Um, he's known to be incredibly difficult to read, even in German, if you speak German. Um, and so I relied on this wonderful little book by someone called Michael Watt, called um, Essential Heidegger for Beginners. Um, So let's, the thing about Martin Heidegger as well, he felt that um, the use of language 
the habitual and overuse of words meant that they became empty, they became meaningless. So he coined his own language. And I actually found his language incredibly helpful in understanding the situation I was in. And I've noticed I've actually taken it on and use it in other contexts. So let's have a look at some of his um, concepts. So the first uh, word that he coined in German, das Sein, uh, which literally means being there. And Heidegger saw that Western philosophy tried to observe objectively and understand humanity by lifting people out of the world in order to isolate an independent essence or pure consciousness. For him, being is related specifically to the human being, individually and collectively. It is all-inclusive of all aspects of experience, past, present and future. So there's something so completely um, whole uh, in the way that he sees this. Uh, I mean, it includes, uh, I mean, genetically includes all our ancestral, the things that we bring with us, everything. And in that sense, it's, uh, it includes everything that is absolutely unique to each person. Um, so, let's go on to the next one. So he saw, um, he, he divided being into uh, two aspects. Uh, the first one is the inauthentic, which is the normal way we live, which is characterized by a lack of awareness of our own self and our own possibilities due to an absorption in ways of living provided by others. Most of us live our lives in this way which Heidegger calls the they-self. So it's very easy, in fact I've been using this term, you know when people start talking about Twitter and things, I go well that's very they-self. Um, um, and that, yes, that, that most of the time we're just completely, all, everything is engaged in terms of social interaction, re, um, relational interaction, and so what he's saying is the authentic self um, is actually completely being, um, coming back to ourselves. So authentic, the mode of existence in which Dasein has escaped the all-pervasive domination of the they-self and is aware of its own self and is true to its own self. But even though the, um, my underworld existential experience, which went on for a very long time, it went on for, for months actually, um, although it was very challenging and very difficult at times, there was something deeply satisfying about it. It felt, so, it felt really real. It was so authentic um, that it was almost... Um, I wanted to return to it. So I would function in the usual way, uh, but then want to return to it. So anxiety. So obviously he's not talking about the usual thing about being worried about something or another. The kind of anxiety he's talking about here is existential anxiety. And sometimes existentialists also talk about existential guilt. So the potentially enlightening experience, it's, it's a potentially enlightening experience, a highly disturbing mood that bluntly confronts us with a constant possibility of our own death. The nothingness that lies at the heart of human existence. So a little quote from Heidegger himself, I myself am in that I will die. So um, life and death in that sense are interdependent. Um, 
if you're born, you're going to die. And there's no death without birth, and there's no birth without death. Um, um, so in terms of existential guilt, um, there's something about um, the guilt of being itself. Because as though, it's all, I mean, the sense I have of that, it's almost like sticking out on a, on a large field and you're standing up and uh, you're not in, in, the, in the landscape, you're standing out from it. So being itself is guilt in that sense. So now he's talking about um, uh, awareness of death. Uh, which is bound up in both um, the inauthentic and the authentic. So Heidegger asserts that when I experience myself as always as a being towards death, I am provided with a vantage point from where I'm able to grasp my whole life, my life as a whole. Um, and he he takes this, and from the, from in the medieval period, this was a really prevalent idea that the moment I'm born, um, I'm, I have the possibility of dying, which is true. Um, and I suppose for me, again, in my, in my experience, um, that, that this experience of being with death um, heightens awareness. There's a, there's a heightened intensity and a richness um, in being itself. And then again from Heidegger's quote himself, which is the most wonderful quote, that death opens up the question of being. So for me it was death that opened up this question. It is the shrine of nothing and the shelter of being. So the inauthentic fear of death, this inauthentic attitude is characterized by a denial of the ever-present possibility of death, which is seen instead as a remote possibility in a distant future. For the, for the moment, happens only to others. And the stinging significance of this is excluded from our feeling of awareness. And this deprives Dasein of a sense of the totality of life. And there's a paradoxical idea here. Um, I mean, it's similar that if, like, for example, if you, um, if you go on a journey, when you get home, you have a sense of the whole journey. So that because of every moment, um, the totality of life is present because of the presence of death, um, that if you, if you are not in being and non-being, if you're not in both of those places, well then the totality of life isn't there, and you live in a sort of half-life, this inauthentic they-self life. Um, another um, word which I found um, uh, really wonderful word, it's like a way of just seeing things in a very different way, is the word clearing. And, he, and clearing is the place in which being reveals itself. So it's almost as though by being in that place, by being in, um, in the completely authentic self, uh, that is the place of clearing, where's this possibility of being revealing itself. Um, and which I'll also go into a little bit later. The other word which I find very interesting is care, or the way he understands care. Because Heidegger sees care as the science fundamental feature. So it's a fundamental feature to really care. Uh, for it is care that makes human existence meaningful, and it is care that directs us to the mystery of being itself. So in a way, he's talking here about care, is really caring about being. 
And it's almost as though by really accessing authentic being that you really begin to care. And because all being is empty of self, empty of any uh, substantial thingness, then the care of being means that um, you care for all being. And in fact, he, um, he, he, he died in 1976, and he talked about then about deep ecology. And what he understood about deep ecology was that um, he felt that unless human beings made this radical change, that um, the, the effect on the planet uh, was, was, was very negative because everything was seen as something that you could use. So a tree is useful because it absorbs carbon dioxide and it gives out oxygen and you can use it to make furniture and tables. From the point of view of authentic self, uh, you care about a tree for its being. Uh, so this was a very radical thing that actually still hasn't happened and still isn't really seen as a, a very, very necessary um, radical change. Heidegger states that the chattering they self does not allow us the courage for anxiety in the face of death. When living inauthentically as the they self, denial or self deception allows an escape from the tremendous impact and significance of the inevitability of death. So uh, the aspects of denial and self perception, self deception, um, leads us to the psychological aspect. So a psychological perspective. Um, the essence, so this is quoting Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud really was the forerunner of, um, of um, psychoanalysis and the idea of the unconscious um, and, and, the, and the idea of repression. Um, so Sigmund Freud said the essence of repression lies simply in the function of rejecting and keeping something out of consciousness. So what, does, what gets repressed? Well, what gets repressed are aspects like shame, fear, trauma, something that's profoundly unacceptable or intolerable, the unbearable likeness of being, um, and that repression, if you think about your constantly pushing something down unconsciously, pushing something down, rejecting it, of coming at not wanting to see it, not wanting it to be made conscious, that takes a lot of energy. Um, and the fact that it has to be a constant thing, so it's a lot of downward force, but there's also a, a huge upward force. So these repressions force themselves up and manifest as neurosis or as projection. Um, <coughs> so the next person we're going to go to is Ernest Becker now the thing about all of these, play, all of these things I'm touching people I'm touching and things I'm touching I, I mean uh, Ernest Becker got Pulitzer Prize he's written two extraordinary books and I'm trying to encapsulate what he said in, in just a, sh a short thing and it was the same with Heidegger there's so, um, so just trying to sort of pick out the essence of what he's saying. Um, uh, well, let's just go on to the next one and just see. So what he said was, it doesn't matter whether cultural hero system is frank. Sorry, let, let me just go back. The reason why he talked about heroism, Ernest Becker, was because what he saw was if, if death is not, uh, 
Freud felt that sexuality was the main uh, repression in human beings, partly because of the culture he lived in and the time that he lived in. And in fact, Freud himself uh, had a huge fear of death. And uh, Ernest Becker kind of saw him as having his own uh, immortality project, which was the projection of his fear of death into the future and, um, and he really hated it when someone was going to overshadow him as the sort of, uh, you know, the main person um, uh, who's, who's sort of bringing the whole thing of psychoanalysis and, and all of that. And, um, and in fact, he, he, is, uh, he is pretty immortal, but um, in some ways, uh, but not in the way maybe he hoped, I don't know. So let's see what he has to say, what Ernest Becker has to say about heroism. Because he saw that um, the main repression being death, uh, that it gets projected into heroism. So he says it doesn't matter whether a cultural hero system is frankly magical, religious and primitive, or secular, scientific and civilised it is still a mythical hero system in which people serve in order to earn a feeling of primary value, of cosmic specialness, of ultimate usefulness to creation, of unshakable meaning. And this has, um, we can see this in the world everywhere we look. You know, uh, um, I don't know, world leaders uh, not being concerned with um, ethics or morality, just wanting, I don't know, to be heroic in some way. Um, and it, this has a huge significance um, for society and for us personally. He also goes on to say that one of the key concepts for understanding man's urge for heroism is the idea of narcissism. So, and then he goes on to say as well, none of these observations implies human guile. So it's not something we do deliberately. It's not something that we kind of contrive and go, oh, I'm going to do this. Uh, a lot of this is so unconscious, but man does not seem to be able to help his selfishness. It seems to come from his animal nature. And he talks about how you can see it right from the word go with children. And it was only the other day when I was with my nephew's children uh, where they were going, no, mine's the biggest, no, mine's the biggest. It's sort of, um, it's sort of absolutely inherent. Uh, but I think there's an interesting edge here because heroism is also noble. Um, you know, people who are dying for a greater good or for another person um, or a cause, even exploration of space is, um, there's something about uh, human endeavor to explore and to know. So I wonder what the other side of heroism is, what he's talking about. What's the narcissistic, what's this uh, repressed, what, how is it, in what way, what's the quality of the repressed uh, death projection? that we are being compelled by in what we're doing. Uh, to me, that's the sort of difference between compulsion and between something that comes from a very different place. So let's have a look. What is the projection from the denial of death? So he says, the first thing we have to do with heroism is to lay bare its underside. Show what gives human heroics its specific nature and impetus. Here we introduce directly one of the greatest rediscoveries of modern thought, that of all things that move man, one of the principal is his terror of death. And he doesn't underestimate the impact and sees that it has huge consequences for us and society. And, and in his book, he he, he lays this out in, in an extraordinary way, but we don't have time to go there at the moment. 
So he says, I mean, because of this um, uh, sort of edge of, of, uh, of noble and um, well, a man being moved by mo noble things, or by the heart, or by beauty, but also this impetus, um, uh, this narcissistic impetus um, towards heroism. He says, the question that becomes the most important one that man can put to himself is how conscious is he of what he is doing to earn his feeling of heroism. So I think, um, I mean, I think we could even sort of look at, I, for me, well, I do look at that. You know, it's so easy to even clothe ourselves in our spiritual aspiration and, and, um, and go, oh, I've got that. You know, it's I mean, and that, that um, so for me, the real question is of discernment and it's a profound question how how that discernment happens and this leads us to the Buddhist perspective um, and insight and how making conscious the unconscious so for the Buddhist perspective um, it was interesting because when I said I was, um, I set out on this journey and these things came to me. I often think if you make an intention, things get given to you. And this book was um, suggested to me, was given to me um, by someone called David Loy, who I think still works in a university in Japan as a Zen Buddhist uh, for 20 years and a Zen um, teacher and also I think teaches existentialism and his book is really really extraordinary uh, and that how he's able to correlate um, death and life and psychotherapy existentialism and Buddhism so again we're just really just trying to pick out the essence um, so he says the Buddhist emphasis on the groundlessness of ego self implies that our most troublesome dualism is not life versus death, but being versus nothingness. The anxious self intuiting and dreading its own lack of being to the extent, sorry, full stop, yeah. So I'll just read that again. Um, the Buddhist emphasis on the groundlessness of ego self implies that our most troublesome dualism is not life versus death, but being versus no thingness. The anxious self intuiting and dreading its own lack of being. To the extent I come to feel autonomous, my consciousness is also infected with a gnawing sense of unreality usually experienced as a vague feeling there is something wrong with me so the Buddhist teaching um, is of non-self so when he says the emphasis is on um, the groundlessness of the ego self Buddhist teaching starts from the point of view that there is no self um, And I certainly recognize that shadowy feeling, there's something wrong with me. Um, and in my underworld experience, I think the, the feeling was, was um, uh, that feeling was very intense. And it wasn't just there was something wrong with me, but the feeling was there's something wrong with the whole universe. Um, but I was able to just stay with it, thank God. Um, so he goes on to say, for Buddhism, our problem turns out to be paradoxical. The actual problem is our deeply regressed fear that our groundlessness, nothingness, is a problem. When I stop trying to fill up that hole at my core by vindicating, vindicating myself in some symbolic way, something happens to it and to me 
So this vindication has this echoes of heroism here. Uh, you know, like, oh, I'm a good person really, or I will aspire to do better, or um, whatever. And um, so again, for me, um, this emptiness at the core, um, this experience that I went through was like a complete arresting of everything. It was just stop. And um, none of the old stories worked, none of the old stuff worked, and I was just left with this hole at my core. But as he says, um, that, that's not the problem. The problem is seeing that it's a problem, and that somehow or other, to actually stay in authentic being, no matter um, what state that being is, is I call it existential prayer because um, uh, if there is something, if there is request uh, in that place or if there's um, some, you know, if there's, um, uh, then, it, then it is answered through being itself. So he goes on to say, so this, moving through this, one does not do anything with that anguish, but develop the ability to dwell in it, or rather, as it, being it. Then the anguish, having nowhere else to direct itself, consumes the sense of self. Since the sense of lack is the other pole of the sense of self, Primordial lack as anguish devours not only the ego self, but itself. It is like matter and antimatter of quantum physics collapsing back into each other and disappearing to reveal the ground they polarized out of. So this experience, for me, when, when this happened, um, uh, initially it was the realization that um, the polarity of life and death, uh, the paradoxical of that, that any polarity, uh, the resolve of any polarity is the third point which includes um, the other two and goes beyond them. So the polarity of life and death is high in Arabic, is the ever-living. And how can the ever-living being, the being as ever-living, ever die? Um, and then the sense of this um, ground appearing um, was for me that I saw um, or I was in a place where there was no birth or death. There was an infinite horizon and it was like being born on the very first day. Um, and it was like uh, the dew of the morning. Um, and this moment contained everything. And I was completely taken out of this sense of everything is wrong into seeing how things are, how things actually are. Um, not an idea, not a, a wonderful poem, but actually how, how things are. And just a, a drop of this elixir uh, just transform, transforms everything. Um, and you go back to your usual stuff but it's not the same. It's, it's just, it imbues everything. It can never, really, it just changes everything. So then, talking about the non-duality of life and death, so Dogen, who's the 13th century Zen master, um, and what he says is just understand that birth and death is itself. Nirvana. 
there is nothing such as birth and death to be avoided. There is nothing such as nirvana to be sought. Only when you realize this are you free from birth and death. So just to um, say that nirvana uh, in Buddhism and in Hinduism um, is a place of perfect peace and happiness um, and is the highest state of enlightenment. Um, and for me it was just great joy in the heart. He also says, because actually in um, Heidegger, his book is uh, called Being and Time, and time is so important in sort of or, or getting a sense of being. Um, so what Dogen says here, uh, which is wonderful, uh, time itself is being, and all being is time. Each moment is all being, is the entire world. Reflect now whether any being or any world is left out of the present moment. So this quality uh, was also in this place that I was for a, a glimpse, that I was shown for a, a, a glimpse. Um, and also echoes Heidegger's um, sense of the world, you know, your whole life uh, is in your in authentic, um, when you return to authentic being, um, then your whole life is grasped in that moment. So the next, the next question is, going back to what um, Ernest Becker Oh no, it was uh, David Loy talked about being able to uh, dwell in anguish. How does one develop the ability to dwell in anguish or as it? And I thought about this and I thought about if someone asked me that, what would I say? Um, and what I came to was I would say it's not, it's not through self-punishment it's not through trying to get rid of yourself. You can't think yourself uh, as nothing. Um, or you can't uh, try and um, remove yourself or punish yourself. And it's not through heroism. It's not by, by being sort of really, um, I don't know, you know, sort of attaining this or attaining that. The only way is through love. And that love, um, so care and care for being is a, is a spiritual practice. Um, I think I'll just leave that there. I think I'll just leave that as a question. Um, so before, before we go tea, I'd just like to read a, a poem. Um, which is by Ibn Arabi which maybe, maybe some of you know I just felt it was the most beautifully exquisite expression of this existential place of being and non-being um, uh, for those well, it was Ralph Austin who translated it, and he himself said it was very difficult to translate. And there's a lot of references um, that may not be um, accessible to people here, to everybody here. Some may be. So I want to read it and for people to kind of just allow it um, to, to touch them wherever it touches them. And uh, he wrote it when... His little daughter had died, and there was something from um, uh, well, something written that Ralph Austin says. There's a story about he met his wife at Mecca. Ibn Arabi met his wife at Mecca, 
and there was a little girl, his little daughter, who, I don't know, maybe it was a toddler or something, uh, just said, oh, look, there's Daddy, which brings it to a very human place. With my very own hands, I laid my little daughter to rest because she is of my very flesh. Thus I am constrained to submit to the rule of parting, so that my hand is now empty and contains nothing. Bound to this moment we are in, caught between the yesterday that has gone and the tomorrow which is yet to come. This flesh of mine is as pure silver, while my inner reality is as pure gold. Like a bow I have grown, and my true posture is as my rib. My Lord it is who says that he has created me in a state of suffering and loss. How then can I hope for any rest? dwelling as I do in such a place and state. Were it not for that state, I would be neither child nor parent, nor indeed would there be any to compare with me, as is the case with my Creator. <coughs> it is surely a case of the qualification being one with respect to an essence which is full of implicit multiplicity. Because I am for my creator in our creation, like one of a multitude. Then my God, alighted between us, in the very fabric of existence, not merely a figment of belief. All with a firm, well-established emergence, to which I may trace my antecedents with confidence. Thus, on the one hand, I can say that I am mortal like yourselves, while you do vouch for me. Always, however, on the understanding that I am not ultimately alike, thus to maintain my integrity. For you have banished all being like from me in the pre-eternal state, and that is my conviction. See how sublime and lofty is my garden of paradise, secure in the company of matchless maidens. He speaks of this as we have also in our book, the Maxida al Asma. Is not created nature, his family and people, as also the very essence of the unique one? Consider how he is a consort for her and how they came together upon my being, so that it split asunder. These words of mine are not written after long deliberation, but have been a part of me eternally. It was none but the Apostle of the Eternal One who activated them within me. He it was who dictated it, leaving me to write it with my hand. Thus is the matter, and none truly knows it, save a leader of the spirit, surpassing in goodness, or one of the golden mean. Indeed, one who is other cannot know it, now or ever. Every branch reverts to its root, no more in any way than when it sprang forth. So, um, so back to our theme. Um, so, um, Inanna paved the way, um, uh, the gateway and the stages into the underworld. Um, so what we're going to look at now is the um, conscious act of die before you die. (coughs) 
So if this, so this is from David Loy, um, uh, the Buddhist perspective, Zen perspective. If the sense of self is a construct composed of automized, mutually reinforcing ways of thinking, feeling and acting, it cannot really die. It can only evaporate in the sense that those cease to recur. And I wanted to start with that because in a sense the truth of it is that there isn't anything to die. Um, so he goes on to say it means giving up what I think I am to stand naked and exposed. This letting go will not be easy. Hence Buddhism calls it the great death. If there is no greater psychological suffering, perhaps there is also none more therapeutic, for this burns away the dross of life. And then I related that to Abraham stepped in the fire, into the fire and found a garden. Uh, I mean, in physical death, it, we come face to face with God. Um, and I was reminded of now you see through a glass darkly and, um, and, that, and then face to face. Um, so here is the idea of the day of judgment and being burnt in the fire. But this fire is really just um, putting, being able to be um, and see all our defences um, and allow them to be stripped from us. And as I say, be naked. Um, so as he says, there's none more therapeutic for this burns away the dross of life. So although there's nothing, I suppose that's the thing I was trying to say with this, although there is nothing to die, it's still a process. It's still an action of being. It's, a, it's actually an action of being. It's not conceptual. It's not something we can think ourselves into. It's like a place, a state of being, where you allow yourself uh, to be seen um, as you are. Uh, without trying to vindicate it, without trying to cover it up. And I suppose my work as a psychotherapist, I work with, I work with this. It's like freeing people, like allowing people to uh, uh, let go of their shame, let go of all of this. And it's uh, done in a very, in, in the sense that, uh, what it reminds me of actually, there's a very simple children's story. Um, where there's a man walking down the road with a cloak around him and um, the wind says to the sun, I bet I can get that man's cloak off quicker than you can. So the wind blows and blows and blows and it blows harder and colder and the more it blows the man holds it tighter and tighter and tighter and then the sun comes out and gets warmer and warmer and spreads its lovely benign rays and he just uh, surrenders, he just takes the cloak off. And, and again, it's through, through love, it's not through rigour. Um, so this is from the Meccan Illuminations, Ibn Arabi. Um, and what he says is now, since we knew that our meeting with God can only be through death, and because we knew the inner reality of death, we sought to bring it about in the life of this world. Hence we died in the very source of our life to all our concerns and activities and desires, so that when death came over us, sorry, when death overcame us, in the midst of that life, which never passes from us, we met God and he met us. And I mean, Belent Ralph, in his paper on union, 
um, talks about how Ibn Arabi would brook no, re no resistance. You know, like die today, um, just do it. Um, so there's something very um, uh, simple and ordinary about it too. It's like, this is how it is, so this is what you do. Um, so, yeah, so, that, so it's all a matter, matter of the heart and the love of truth and beauty because it's only through love that you would surrender in that way. Um, so now I'm going to read a, another poem, which in a way is another way of looking at this theme of it being um, something that's wonderful to do. Um, that this is, uh, um, so this is a poem by uh, Rumi uh, with a translation by Colm Barks. So a lover was telling his beloved how much he loved her, how faithful he had been, how self-sacrificing, getting up at dawn every morning, fasting, giving up wealth and strength and fame, all for her. There was a fire in him. He didn't know where it came from, but it made him weep and melt like a candle. You've done well, she said, but listen to me. All this is the decor of love, the branches and leaves and blossoms. You must live at the root to be a true lover. Where is that? Tell me. You've done the outward acts, but you haven't died. You must die. When he heard that, he lay back on the ground, laughing and died and he opened like a rose that drops to the ground and died laughing that laughter was his freedom and his gift to the eternal as moonlight shines back at the sun he heard the call to come home and went when light returns to its source it takes nothing of what it has illuminated it may have shone on a garbage dump or a garden or in the centre of a human eye. No matter. It goes and when it does, the open plain becomes passionately desolate, wanting it back. So, so this is a matter of joy. So let's come back uh, to uh, Heidegger's question, what is the meaning of being? Um, because the question in, is, is really asked from being, of being. And Heidegger um, saw that truth isn't an object. It, 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 a truth is a constant, um, uh, if you like, the, the clearing, uh, the revelation of being. Uh, that, that truth is just con is, a, is a constant process. It's absolutely non-fixed, and in fact, as soon as you start grasping on something, you've lost it. Um, so that's one aspect of what is the meaning of being, for me. I think another aspect is. Uh, there's something about being in a place where you accept um, the imminent possibility of death. So being, uh, being in a place which is both in the being and non-being uh, heightens... Um, well, the be being um, is very beautiful. Uh, being has a quality. It's very different than um, knowing something or hearing about something. It's like, um, or even seeing it. It's more like actually being it. And that for me, I mean, it was, um, I had also had, um, it's also things like 
go, you know, sort of going to the park and seeing, finding such an exquisite tenderness in everything because everything is going to die. And all these little new leaves are also going to die. But it's just tender. I, that's the only way I can explain it. So there's something about living in this way, which is what the meaning of being is, uh, which is why I, I wanted uh, to put at the end here um, uh, this, this hadith. Um, and someone, I, my pronunciation of Arabic is not very good. Someone who's got, who could, who's got good pronunciation of Arabic, maybe they could um, read it. Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu shamal. Okay. So, so I think I just want to end by saying um, that um, God loves, God is extremely beautiful and loves beauty and that my profound existential prayer was answered in a way beyond anything I could have asked for. So I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you.